The Pittsburgh Pirates just won an opening day thriller against the Miami Marlins. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team, your Pittsburgh Pirates every day. And who boy, was that a start <laughs> to this 2024 campaign for this Pittsburgh Pirates team. Again, my name is Ethan Smith. You can follow me right there on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates for all of your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And folks, this one was an opening day thriller for the Pittsburgh Pirates. It just was. It, it was a phenomenal game uh, that we got to see from Miami and Pittsburgh. This game had it all. <laughs> I mean, genuinely, this game had it all. It was just a very fun one to watch. Obviously, uh, went a lot longer than I think a lot of us expected this game to go. And again, it just had everything. Um, by the way, hoping you'd come on. Yeah, I had this ready to go. I was ready to go for this and have an instant reaction to it. And this game it was definitely one of those games, too, where you look at a Major League Baseball. And obviously, opening day, we don't know everything about this team yet. But there were definitely some things that happened in this game that were highlighted throughout spring training that I told everybody were going to be major strengths of this roster they end up being major strengths of this roster, um, which is very nice. Harper Man, how are you, brother? Uh, he says, nice seeing you live for the first time in like a year. Um, I'm going to be live uh, for a lot of these post games. I think it's going to be something very fun to interact with you guys on a daily basis for the games that I can do it for. Obviously, with work and everything, I won't be able to do it for every single game, but it is something that I want to do on a daily basis. But getting into this game, um, and honestly – Enjoyer, you start right where I want to start, honestly. Uh, the same running uh, runners and scoring position issues from last season are just a fluke. I mean, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt with it being game one. And, you know, everybody's still kind of getting ramped up and getting ready to go and figuring stuff out. I mean, you saw that with pitching. You saw that with hitting on both sides. You saw that with fielding on both sides. But the Pirates were two for 17 with runners in scoring position in this game. Two for 17 and left 13 players on base. You take advantage in those spots. This game doesn't even get to the point that it did with uh, the 12 innings that we saw today in Miami. But man, you got to fix that. That is something that cannot linger. I mean, you have the sixth inning where they had bases loaded with one out. You look at two strikes looking. Not something that you really want to keep on doing. You, again, get another one where another time you have bases loaded and one out. You walk away with one run, at least in that scenario. O'Neal Cruz, by the way, man, struggles against lefties. We know that. O'Neal Cruz struggles against lefties. He had a pretty solid game, though. Obviously had that tying home run against Sixto Sanchez that led us to going to extra innings. And there was a lot. I mean, that's where a lot of people were saying on Twitter right away that, man, this is going to be a lot to talk about. But the runners in scoring position thing, definitely. But let's kind of take this all the way through like a story. Uh, Mitch Keller, don't know what was going on really there uh, with Mitch Keller. Um, obviously has, I would say, a relatively okay day. It wasn't obviously a day that he would like really at all. Um, he goes five and two thirds, obviously has seven hits, four earned runs three strikeouts, two walks. Really, I think the big story that you would take away from this game for Mitch Keller, excuse me, is that a lot of those two strike counts that he was getting into, specifically if you go back and rewatch this game against Jake Berger, of all people, and Josh Bell, and a lot of just really the middle of that lineup, it just seemed like he was leaving stuff in the zone. The velocity was dipping a little bit, and – Really, the slider was, I think, the biggest issue for Mitch Keller today. The slider was just being left in really bad spots. Jake Berger specifically was taking advantage of that a lot. 
Um, he had a great day, and you even mentioned it here, Tasha, that he had a wonderful day. And again, it wasn't anything from Mitch Keller that I think you have to be overly worried about. He only surrendered four on runs in those five and two thirds. I think the hits more was the more concerning thing and the placement of some of the pitches. Those things will come along for him. He's a talented enough pitcher. He'll be just fine. But, you know, he allows the four and runs that put the Buccos in a hole pretty quick. Um, they were down in a hole relatively fast. But then Brian Reynolds, who had a phenomenal day, hits that two-run home run that kind of – I mean, this game was dragging for a little bit. But when it got to two to two – Brian Reynolds, obviously phenomenal. Two hits on the day, two RBIs, also had the two strikeouts. Um, and, you know, like the offense, there was the relative guys that you expected to really do well in this game offensively. You look at um, Brian Reynolds, who I just mentioned, two for five on the day, hits the home run. Hayes was two for four on the day, had two walks on the day as well. The Buccos got on base via the free pass pretty well today. I mean, top four of their order, Connor Joe, Brian Reynolds, Key Brian Hayes, and Andrew McCutcheon had six walks to their credit. Now they also had seven strikeouts to their credit, which that bottom of the order struggled a lot in this game too. But as I told everybody going into the season, the long ball was going to be what the Pirates were going to really use as a positive this year. You saw that with Brian Reynolds. You saw that with Edward Olivares, who comes in to pinch hit for Rowdy Telez and just sends one over the wall. I talked about Edward Olivares a lot throughout uh, spring training and throughout the offseason, mentioning that he is a real power threat off the bench if you want to use him as a fourth outfielder. And it's really nice to see that you get these things. You get the power from Oliveras. You get it from Reynolds. You get it from Key Brian Hayes, who wrote the double into the left field uh, wall er uh, earlier in the game. O'Neal Cruz, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, ties up the game with an opposite field home run. Where it really, those are the kind of pitches that when you look at the top players in baseball, they make that pitch happen for them. They make that pitch happen for them. And that's what O'Neal Cruz did there. And power was the big reason why they won this game. The Marlins didn't have a homer in this game. That was the biggest reason. And we had Peter Pratt on the show this morning, and he mentioned that for the Marlins, they're a team that is going to pretty much play small ball. That's just how they're built with the likes of Tim Anderson and the likes of Luis Arise, who went 0 for 6 today. Great job by the bullpen and the entire pitching staff on taking him out of the game. Josh Bell, obviously more of a power threat. Um Tim Anderson had a hit in there. Jake Berger, again, you guys already kind of mentioned three of the eight hits on the day for the Miami Marlins from Jake Berger. But I think the biggest story that you have to take away from this game is when you look at what they're doing with how this game went, a lot of people were wondering, well, you go into the season starting it, you have Colin Holderman on the IL. You have Carmen Majinski on the IL. Today, Rowanzi Contreras gets put on the paternity list, and Jose Hernandez, who was fully thinking he was going to AAA Indianapolis this weekend, is thrust into the final inning to get his first professional save. And folks, I don't know if you know this from watching the game, but Josh Fleming, Hunter Stratton, and I'm going to name all of them. Josh Fleming, Hunter Stratton, Brian Barucki, Araldis Chapman, Luis Ortiz, and Jose Hernandez combined to give up one hit. One hit after Mitch Keller left this game. And that is phenomenal. They did that without David Bednar. And uh, DK Pittsburgh Sports reported that David Bednar was not available today, but he will be available for the rest of the series. But when you can have a game like this where you have a bullpen, that can only give up one hit over the course of six to se almost, almost seven innings today without the likes of Majinski, without Colin Holderman, without David Bednar. Folks, that is awesome stuff. Josh Fleming, one pitch, one out. Hunter Stratton did pretty well. He gave up the one hit, got the K, got out of there. Ryan Barucki showed up again, was one of the best pitchers last year out of the bullpen in terms of whip. Showed up again this year, one and one-third. Araldis Chapman went in at one scoreless inning, one strikeout. Luis Ortiz, two strong innings of work, man, from Luis Ortiz at extra innings. He did a phenomenal job eliciting those two double plays. And he kept the game 
in reach for this Pittsburgh Pirates team. And then Jose Hernandez in that final inning, they gave him the shot. And they said, you know what? Here you go, kid. Go get your first career save. And Bake, I love the name, by the way. Bake, I agree with you. Uh, the Bucks do have the offense to come back in games now. They do. This is a team that in games like today, for instance, in games like today, and I was saying this to uh, somebody um, in a chat that I'm in, in games like this, this team is built to win games like this. They have the bullpen to win games like this. They have the offense, as you're saying here, to come back in games. O'Neill Cruz can hit a home run, and a, or as we like to call it, a cruise missile, at any point. He can do that. Um, And yeah, I mean, genuinely, it was very nice to see that you have the offense. That when this game was 5-2, to two, there wasn't really any panic. There, I mean, there was. I mean, they had two hits at the time. But then you, you you started seeing it pick up. Edward Olivares got that home run. And ever since Edward Olivares hit that homer, it kind of just created a domino effect throughout the entire lineup. You saw the team kind of pick it up. You saw Jared Triolo kind of pick it up. The top of the lineup started to pick it up. You were getting runners on base. You were scoring runs in any way that you could find possible. You look at Andrew McCutcheon and how he scored that dribbler. That was a big one because then that led to O'Neill Cruz being able to tie the game late in the eighth inning. This team is built to win games just like this because they have a top 10 bullpen in baseball and it didn't even have three of its best options available to it today. And they gave up one hit <laughs> in six innings of work almost, almost seven. And that's very good stuff to see. Because now you're saying, okay, well, if the Buccos are in games that are close, then they're going to win a lot more of these games close, which in turn is going to result in more W's in the win column. It's going to result in playing meaningful baseball later this year, potentially. And if we're going to overreact here, we can. And Steel City, if our bullpen is this good without Majinski and Bednar, imagine what it's going to be like when they're back. Imagine what this bullpen is going to be like when we get a lead and we're not coming from behind and we're not trying to play catch up. I mean, for example, let's say tomorrow's game, folks, tomorrow's game. Let's say that the Pirates are up two to one in the sixth inning and move to the bullpen. How on a scale of one to 10, and you guys can comment on this and I'll share your thoughts so the audio people can hear as well. How, I mean, honestly, how concerned are you if you have a lead with this bullpen? Because I'll be honest, I'm pretty darn confident that if the Pirates have a lead late in games that they aren't giving it up. Um, to move to another comment while you guys share that, uh, Kackinson, 17 strikeouts, two for 17 with runners in scoring position. Yeah, definitely a uh, definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, the 17 Ks is something to keep an eye on, as Brady says. The other team won't gain any ground because the bullpen bringing the golden net down. Exactly. They're not going to it. David, how are you, sir? Um, I actually didn't do too bad. I had a couple of IPAs and that was it. Uh, my tweets hint at it a little bit because I was just getting very, very annoyed with, um, I was getting very annoyed with just the, the strikeouts looking. It was just getting to me. And I just didn't understand that either. I mean, there were situations like, again, that situation where I truthfully thought the Pirates lost this game was when they had bases loaded and one out. And you go up there and you look at two strikeouts swinging or looking, two strikeouts back to back looking. In that situation, you got to be aggressive. You have to be. You can't go up there and hope for a walk. Even Triolo in that 3 2 count, you could tell. With him not swinging at that pitch, he was hoping for a walk to score a run, and you can't do that. David says his confidence level with this bullpen is a nine. Bake says a five. Uh, five. <laughs> By the way, they mentioned this, and I thought it was great. And again, before I had that show uh, with Peter Pratt, I didn't even notice it with Miami. And then I went and looked at the National Series, and yeah, the Pirates are facing five straight lefties to start the season. So don't be shocked, and I know this is going to make people mad, don't be shocked if O'Neill Cruz sits down for a game or two in these first five games after today um, and you see Alika Williams. Don't be surprised at all because I just think it's something with matchups. 
Uh, Rowdy Telez uh, struggled today against the lefties too. Jack Sawinski, you obviously saw they didn't even try to play with it. Um, Steel City W on his confidence level in the bullpen says a two, unless it's Chapman warming up, then an eight. Uh, and I agree here. Um, and this is kind of the point that I just made. Um, Haynes needs to teach his batters to be more aggressive with runners in scoring position instead of taking all these called third strikes. It's a problem. And now I know, again, it's game one. That is the one thing I want to preface with everything that we're talking about on this live show. It is game one. We don't know the trends of this team yet. But if this becomes a trend, it's a problem, especially with runners in scoring position. The Pirates, again, just to nail it on the head, were 2 for 17 today with runners in scoring position and 13 runners were left on base. I mean, Henry Davis, 4, Triolo, 2, Michael A. Taylor, runners left in scoring position with two outs. And you don't really do much with it. And, and this game could have been over on both sides. Let me Let me preface that, too. Miami had a lot of opportunities to win this game, especially early with Mitch Keller. With the issues he was having with placement on his pitches today, Miami could have made this game 6-7-2 well before it was 5-2. And for the Pirates, I mean, they even capitalized more on one of those innings where they had bases loaded and one out. Then this game doesn't even go to extra innings the way that this bullpen pitched. And that's what I think the biggest takeaways from this game are. The the, bull, the bullpen was shut down. It was great. And again, it didn't have its best options. The offense can come back in ball games. It can because it has power in the lineup. That's really what won them this game today. Miami did not have a home run. The Pirates had, I believe, three. Yeah, you had Reynolds, Cruz, and Oliveras. That's That changes games because it, at the snap of a finger, boom, you change the game. Uh, Harper Man says, again, thank God we're not Oakland, Washington, or Colorado. If you listen to my, pre or my, um, my preview show the other day, I don't think Washington's going to be all that bad. Um, Tasha says, to be fair to Hank, two of his outs with runners in scoring position had expecting batting averages of like – <laughs> 660 plus just Jake Berger decided to do his best key impression. Yeah, that one was tough for Henry because you could tell he squared that ball up. Uh, really squared it up too in extra innings on that uh, Tim Anderson dropped line drive. Uh, that was something as well. Mateo, honestly, yes, this is right. Now just make sure that that little accent gets taken out of there because his name is spelled without the accent um, and the N is lowercase. But there was a lot to like from today. I, I really think there was. It was a very phenomenal game. Kackinson, I agree 100%. Luis Ortiz looked awesome in extra innings. High leverage situations, runner starting on second in both innings, obviously with the Manfred role um, in extra innings. And really, he just looked comfortable. He got double plays. He had only two walks, and it was great. Now, if we're also going to talk about the elephant in the room, because I I swear that you guys want me to mention it, Brian Epps, hey, hello, hi, how are you? Mike Rapello needs to go ASAP. Give me Joey Cora back. Folks, I don't know what was going on with those decisions. I get being aggressive. Um, I did say Henry Davis uh, was at fault there, but I didn't realize Rebello sent him on that play. Why you're sending him on that play, I don't know. I get being aggressive, but not there. You had you had the opportunity to have a runner at third, and you were hitting the baseball relatively well later in the game. So to rip it out of the hands of your hitter like that. And then also with the Triolo play, I also understood O'Neal Cruz going home to a sense because I he must have thought the uh, the play was going elsewhere. But I'm like, what are we doing here, man? Like there was just a lot, there was a lot of mistakes today. You had the Jared Triolo. Uh, mistake with the double play. You had Mitch Keller nearly throw the ball out into the center field or out in the center field on a double play opportunity. And I mean, play of the game uh, uh, to a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of different plays of the game you could have. You could have O'Neill Cruz hitting the uh, home run, but Connor Joe saved this baseball game, folks. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, uh, O'Neill Cruz uh, made that throw. It was an off-balance throw. 
uh, that he or uh, off throw for Connor Joe to have to catch. Rowdy Telez does not make that play. Connor Joe, who is a plus uh, DRS guy, defensive run save guy, made a phenomenal play to make that play. And that play saved the game. Genuinely, it saved the game for this team. That has to be the play a play of the game. And um, so do you think in terms of trades this year, we should do what the Steelers did from 1933 to 2023 and do nothing because this lineup is currently perfection? No, um, I do find it hard to believe with acquisitions who would slot in. Uh, I think the only outside acquisition you would really get um, at this point is a first baseman. I think everywhere else um, is fine for the most part. I don't think you really have any other issues. And Mateo, I agree with this too. Triolo didn't have the greatest day. He really didn't. I mean, he obviously playing second for the uh, first time this year, um, played it a little bit uh, throughout the minor leagues and everything, but being the full-time second baseman today, you know, probably some jitters in there, had his uh, parents in the crowd, one for six on the day, two strikeouts. But as you said, when it mattered, you know, he was horrible until it counted. He got the big hit that ended up being the difference. And how can you not be romantic about baseball is also what have you, uh, you've said. I do agree with this, David. I would have loved to see Rowdy on that play. Um, <laughs> it would have been interesting to see what he would have done. Now, I do agree with this, too. Uh, I didn't like... Henry, and I'm not going to say anything crazy about this. Um, I understood why he was running the way he was because he definitely thought it was caught, but I, eh, we'll, we'll leave it at that because I don't want to say anything that I'm going to get mad about. Uh, Brady B says, I was very impressed with Luis Ortiz. Hope there's more of that to come from him. So do I. Truthfully, I really do hope that Luis Ortiz can be this kind of guy for this team. And also something that I have heard pitched around to me that I would be okay with is a lot of people think that Bailey Falter is going to be an opener for Luis Ortiz. And if Luis or if that's going to work for Luis Ortiz and we get that version of Luis Ortiz, every time he goes out there, if it takes Bailey Falter being an opener for him, sure, sure. 100%. Give me that. Because Luis Ortiz looked great. Uh, Kackinson, does Kutch have anything left in the tank other than walking a ton? Simple answer is yes, personally. Uh, the one relationship that needs to come back is the Pirates and the Commissioner's Trophy. Yes. Um, James, how are you? Opening day hyped? Very. This was a very fun game to watch. I think that's what, another thing that we can all walk away from from this one. This was just a very fun game to watch, genuinely. It was a very, very fun game to uh, sit down, enjoy as a fan and covering the team. And I enjoyed it. I mean, it seems like everybody else enjoyed it as well. And when you break it down, again, this game really had everything. The Pirates fell behind late. Mitch Keller didn't have the greatest day. The offense didn't panic. It didn't look great through those first five innings, but it didn't panic. Edward Olivares really kind of lit up the offense a little bit with that home run. The offense came back and fought back, clawed back, and clawed back, got to 5-5, and then you did what you had to do in extra innings. You weren't scoring through the 10th and 11th, but you trusted in your guy, in Luis Ortiz, to go out there and get it done. He got it done. And I think that's the biggest thing, is trusting the guys that you have on your team. And the Pirates have real guys. You heard them mention it pregame on Sportsnet Pittsburgh that this is the best team that Derek Shelton has now. This is the best team that he has at this point. And it's and trust your guys. If somebody's playing well, leave them out there. We I don't need to see the experiments anymore. Leave them out there. Let it ride. Let them have fun. Brady said, did you understand the point of the Shelton challenge? To a degree, yes. Um, I understand it, it wasn't blocking. Um, it was a slow paced play. He had time to come away from home plate to tag him. So it was never going to get overturned. But I understood why he was doing it just in the case of maybe they do. And, you know, he didn't really lose anything by losing the challenge at that point. Um, thankfully, there wasn't another play that really warranted needing a challenge because you do lose the challenge after you lose it. But, um, I didn't see any problem with it, really. Um, 
Other things, again, the strikeouts concern me. Uh, hopefully that does not become a trend. 17 strikeouts on the day for the Pirates. The bullpen, again, I cannot talk about it more. The bullpen is phenomenal. Um, and again, it was without your top guys today. Any other questions that you guys have as we're talking about the Pirates winning 6-5 to five over the Miami Marlins in this 12-inning thriller that we had today? Uh, dream matchup, uh, Cleveland versus Pittsburgh in the World Series would be awesome. Uh, yes, I also enjoyed this too. Baseball is fully back when you start enjoying the fans booing pitches that were six feet outside of the zone. Yeah, there was a slider, I think. It was um, the pitch before Triolo hit. <laughs> it was the pitch before Triolo hit the ball that ended up winning the game. And it was a slider that was like in the other batter's box and the fans were booing. Now, I will also say this too. The umpire today was horrible. And he was horrible on both sides. But let's just preface that before I have Miami Marlins fans or anybody say, well, it was, it was bad on both sides. Yeah, it was. It was horrible on both sides today. I mean, there were strike calls against the Pirates. And I was just like, I was taken aback. I mean, some of the stuff was well below the knees. And Brian Reynolds, by the way, it took him all of one pitch, <laughs> one pitch to already be complaining to the umpire this year. So I thought that was fun. Um, and this is really the biggest part of it too today. Uh, Dennis Pavlik, Mr. Hernandez, that being Jose Hernandez with the save, and he wasn't even on the roster until Contreras went on paternity leave. Yeah, awesome story there. Got Gets the first save. Didn't even expect to be on the roster. He ends up being there anyway. Um Kackinson says, do you think Oliveras gets the start tomorrow? Um, I don't know, uh, because you do have the three right, uh, right-handed right outfielders that you have out there. I would like, so this is what I would like to see, especially with another lefty tomorrow and uh, AJ Puck, I believe it is, for the Miami Marlins. I would like to see them slide Connor Joe to first, sit Telez tomorrow against the lefties. He just didn't look good at all, two strikeouts. Didn't really threaten at all. So move Connor Joe up to first. Um, and then I would be I would be okay with Oliveras in um right field. Um the biggest issue uh that you really have there is you already have Reynolds and then um Michael A. Taylor. So are you saying that you're gonna sit Sawinski for the second straight day? I don't really know if they're gonna do that. I know Sawinski struggles against lefties a lot, so I could see him starting tomorrow, but I it also might just end up being in a pinch hit role again depending on what Derek Shelton decides to do. Thank you. I've been growing it out, trying to make it look good for all of you. Uh, Tasha says, Martin Perez masterclass tomorrow. I am very excited to see uh, Martin Perez pitch tomorrow. He had a very strong spring. I think he's going to be a very strong player for this team. I think he's going to help Mitch Keller anchor that rotation a bit that needs it. Um, and yeah, you're right. Remember, I did call this in December that Martin Perez was going to get uh, acquired by this team. And I'm, I think that's going to be fun. I mean, we look at tomorrow. Obviously, uh, we'll be talking about uh, tomorrow's game on the show in the morning uh, on tomorrow's show. Also, some more notes on this that I can gather when I go to StatCast because you guys know that I'm going to go look at StatCast because I love StatCast and StatCast is life. And I'm going to go look at some things uh, that I see from StatCast. Sal Belly has a question. Um how many games will it take to get Joe to be the everyday first baseman? So Winsky needs some bats and Joe showing up to be an everyday guy. Yeah, I, I do definitely think that Connor Joe is going to get a good bit of time at first base, especially against righties. I think, or well, Telez will play against righties, but against lefties, I would throw Connor Joe in there every day. I, I, anytime you face a left-handed pitcher, I wouldn't even screw with having Rowdy Telez in there against the lefty. I just wouldn't. I just don't think it's something that suits him really at all. It's not something that he's going to be comfortable doing at this point. And uh, yeah, I mean, he showed up today defensively and a little bit offensively. He had the one scored run. He got on base twice via the walk. There you go. What's more likely the pirates winning the NL central or getting in the wild card. I predicted them to get in the wild card, but with this division, we really don't. We just genuinely don't know. Andrew Fox asks, uh, how many innings does Perez go tomorrow? I'd say five, probably. You know, it'll probably be a very similar start to what we saw from Jesus Lazardo today. Um, five innings, two earned runs. Probably not the strikeout numbers that Lazardo had today, but that's what I think we can expect. 
uh, from Perez tomorrow. We'll talk about that again on the show, uh, probably in a full segment about Perez, about what he can do tomorrow and what he can bring. And you could have to DH. Yeah. Uh, Kutch is going to need those rest days. Uh, yeah. I was thinking this too, Josh. I was like, do the Marlins have a right-handed hitter or right-handed pitcher? I was thinking that the whole time. I was like, do they have anybody on their roster that pitches right-handed like at all? <laughs> so I'm like, dude, they have to have somebody that throws from the right side, but folks banner day. Thank you guys already. We've already had five episodes this week. We have this show. We're going to have another show tomorrow. The season is back. The Pirates won six to five in this 12 inning thriller today. You guys are absolutely amazing for tuning into this live post game reaction show. Again, make sure you follow me on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates for all of your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And like you said, Steel City, 161 to go. It's a marathon. James, thank you so much. Great show. Appreciate it. Guys, again, make sure you also check out the show on YouTube and all of your audio platforms because it is free and available to you every Monday through Friday. And folks, until then, see you on the flip side.